terrorist attacks continue as gunmen kill in Kaduna and Katsina. Meanwhile, Bochi State Governor Bala Muhammad says that he will never apologize for opposing profiling of patriotic Fulani herders. And the Sultan of Sakoto, Mohammed Saad Abubakar, has said that no, not all Fulani headsmen engage in terrorism. Of course, stakeholders say that incessant abductions may hamper Nigeria's quest for economic and social growth. This is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Ann Cohen. Eighteen people have been reportedly killed and many others abducted following attacks by bandits on communities in Igabi and Chinkun local government areas of Kaduna State. The State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Mr. Samuel Arwan, said the attacks took place in the last 48 hours during which many houses were burned. About 20 cows rustled and some poultry carted away. While Bauchi State Governor Bala Muhammad has said that he will never apologize for opposing the profiling of patriotic Fulani herders as killers and kidnappers. Also, the Sultan of Sakoto Al Haji Muhammad Sa'ad Abubakar III has said that not all Fulani herders engage in terrorism. Well, discussing with me today is security expert Kaber Adamu, political analyst at Dewali Ademola, and political commentator at Deni Kunu. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you, Mary. Good evening. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Mr. Kaber. Give us an insight into what you think or what you made of um, Governor Bala Muhammad's statement. Now, he's refusing to apologize, saying he was um, opposing uh, the profiling, the wrongful profiling of Fulani herders and, uh, as kidnappers. Um, does this statement not negate the excuse that was made earlier on after his first speech um, by his aide saying that he was quoted out of context? Um, so frankly, we're in an era of um, what I would call four power by um, our governors and several other leaders. Uh, they make statements perhaps uh, on the spur of the moment and driven by the emotions they were feeling at the time they make those statements. And then they now find it difficult to either justify or to corroborate those statements. And most times the humble thing to do is to apologize and say you add. But unfortunately, we haven't seen that um, you know, by most of our leaders who have made those statements. Now specific to uh, the statement by uh, Governor Bala Mohammed, um, every right thinking person is against ethnic profiling and stigmatization. I am personally against ethnic profiling and stigmatization of the Fulani race. I am you know, supportive of diversity, inc inclu inclusion, and equity. And these two principles of um, uh, ed ethnic profiling and stigmatization are against these three global principles. And so to that extent, I agree with him. However, I'm also conscious that we have and um, firearms act in the country. And that firearms act is the current law that guides the procurement of weapons in the country. Now that act says clearly who is supposed to possess a weapon in the country. Um, any non-state actor, apart from the, um, a member of the armed forces, mm -hmm. any non-state actor who wants to bear a must obtain a license, either directly issued by the president or with authority delegated to the Inspector General of Police. Now, anyone outside this, this um, criteria, this, this provision of the law, who possesses an arm is doing so illegally. And I expect that anyone in authority, uh, whether at the local government or the state level or the federal level, the least they can do is to comply with this provision in our constitution or the, the extant law that I've just quoted. Now, he made a case, um, he said that um, no tribe or group, I'm quoting him directly, um, is free from criminality. Uh, he said, so labeling a particular um, tribe or ethnicity was unfair and would breed disunity in the country. Um, 
I mean, obviously everybody agrees that there is crime and criminality in different parts of the country, but then does it negate the fact that most of the people who are doing this are from a certain ethnicity? Um, so uh, the, the truth of it is no one has that data, and that's the saddest part of our reality in Nigeria today. Um, I, and, you know, I, anyone who has that data should make it public. There is a lot of um, uh, innuendo and suggestions that a particular ethnic group is behind some of these crimes. But frankly, we haven't compared the data or the suggestion with the other with, with other ethnic group. So as a security practitioner, I know it is uh, detrimental to solving the problem when you stigmatize or um, ethnic profile like that. What you should do instead is to call a spade what it is. Now, it is if the person committed the, the crime because he's from that ethnic stock, the answer is no. But he's committing the crime because he's a criminal. The same solution that you would apply to a Fulani man is the same solution you would apply to a, an Igbo man or a Yoruba man or whatever ethnic group. So the point I'm making is um, using ethnic profiling or stigmatization to label crimes would only further divide the country. And unfortunately, because we've had experiences in the past, it could lead to uh, our ugly experiences 1967 to 1970, or even worst scenarios like what we had in Rwanda not too long ago, where there was an ethnic genocide. We've, we've already monitored things like that in, in Nigeria, where a group of Fulani persons traveling from Taraba through Benue were attacked, their vehicle was burned simply because they were Fulani. And no right-thinking person who uh, respects the laws of nature would accept that you don't attack people for who they are. Yes, if they are criminals, subject them to the criminal justice system. And, the, and I think this is the point um, that everybody should, should, should support. Um, ethnic profiling, frankly, would lead us to more cons negative consequences than any positive outcome. I will, I will come back to you because I want to talk about the politicization of this issue. But let me go to... Um, uh, um, Adeni Yukunu. Adeni, there was an attack in Kaduna today um, that has left at least 18 people dead at the hands of these bandits, uh, and some, of, some people call them terrorists. Um, seven natives and residents were named as victims who had died uh, on the spot. Now, there are people, are we still saying that? Because don't forget, the, um, there are people who are saying that these people are not necessarily terrorists and they're not necessarily bandits. Um, Sheikh Gumi has termed them as freedom fighters or people who are fighting against um, ethnic biases. But what has happened today? Can we still keep saying that these people are not bandits or criminals? I mean, because they are gunmen, they're armed and they're killing people. Adeni, can you hear me? You, I think you need to unmute yourself so we can hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Is it better? Yes. All right? You see, one of the things that many of us do not seem to realize is what we have now is a function of the negligence and incompetence of leadership in the country over the past years. Uh, with special attention to the First Republic in the past 21 years, one of the things that has allowed such a problem to be devil enough, for instance, is that attention has not been paid very seriously to the issues of education and, of course, the making better of people's lives. That is on the one hand. Then when we're talking about the problem at the moment, I have to tell you very significantly that many of our security operatives perhaps are not taking cognizance of the terrain, of the kind of things you have. For instance, let, let me go to Igabi, the local government area that was attacked, as well as um, uh, Chikung. Igabi is about 3,222 square kilometers. And as of 2006, when they had the census, the number of residents in Igabi were about 581,000 plus. So if I were to be generous with the population, between then and now, I can put the population of a local government at 1.5 million, and the location, talking about Igabi, is about just 300 square kilometers less than the entire Lagos, where you have about 25 million people. 
Now, if I go again to Chikun, the other local government, Chikun is 4,466 square kilometers. As of 2006 census, the population of people living in Chikun was put at 372,000 plus. So if I'm also very generous with that population, it means it's about 1,500, 1.5 million. So imagine first how 1.5 million people will be living at a place that is bigger than Lagos, and how many police officers do you even have in such a place such that you are able to even provide basic security of lives and property? So when you hear that certain areas are attacked and people are killed, uh, we have to actually tailor all of these things. I'm very happy that we have a security expert on ground now who perhaps might corroborate what I'm saying. That is one of the factors you consider when you're talking about security issues. I therefore have to say that we need to reinvent ourselves. The federal police structure, I have to say very emphatically, cannot deal with the issues that we have now. And that is why we need to do a lot with the kind of policing that we are operating, such that we pay attention to the people dealing with it. For instance, there was a particular video recording released of the person that said he wanted money for the abducted children at Kagara. As we speak, the children are still there. As of yesterday, it's actually in the news today, the man was saying the children can die of hunger and the parents can come to pick their dead bodies, that they have to pay them certain amounts of money. It tells you again that to the bandit, who to me is not different from Boko Haram or any other criminal, it has become something that they are fisting on. So I have to say that government must really reinvent itself for us to deal with these issues. Interesting. Mr. Adekola, I'm coming to you now. Um, there is some perception held in certain quarters that um, the activities of these men, I mean, just to take it from where Adeni Kunu has stopped, um, that some of these activities of these men have been linked to Boko Haram or terrorist-like activities. Um, so the, the truth is, one would ask, why are we not prescribing these guys as terrorists? Why are we still um, you know, handling the issue as if it were an egg-like kind of situation? Hello, thank you very much. I am Adewani Ademola Justice, like you introduced. You see, the issue on ground is a direct outfall of the irresponsibility of government. When I mean government now, I'm not talking just about the federal government, the respective levels of government we have in the country. Either as their, their nomenclature does not matter in this issue, it is the safety and security of lives of Nigerians. You will see, if local security mechanisms are on ground, if traditional rulers are made to assume and accept responsibility, then if the policing per Nigerian ratio is reasonable, hello? Yes, I can hear you. Then our security intelligence network, if they are working, because it is a national shame that an entire state, not the nation Nigeria now, but even for a state, a subset of the country, to be attacked by people, and they will successfully carry out their activities without being maimed, without being tamed, without being arrested. But you do understand that we're very under-policed in this country. You understand how stretched our security forces are. I'm not in any way making a case for them, but this is the, reali uh, the reality of uh, uh, the policing system in this country. See, it is not an absolute issue from the under-policing. You see, aside the police structure, there are some other quasi-security systems around. And you know, if the, if the military, if, the, if our politicians have one or two things to do, they have a way of getting those quasi-security systems to work for them. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. But now when it is left for the average Nigerian, nobody pays any form of attention. See, if you take away the, the policing aspect, you know, we are, we are campaigning for state policing, but do ask the respective state government structures, what do they do with the security boards that go to them monthly? If the people in your vicinity as a state government are not safe, what the hell do you expect the federal government to come down and do? Luckily, you know, our national security system have been decimated as having collapsed and failed because over the years you've been hearing of the attacks. See, 
either they are terrorists or bandits or herdsmen, they are criminals. Do you understand? Hmm. But then... By sheer general, they are criminals. So we shouldn't be concerned about the, the sub-nomenclature given to them. Because governments over the years have been condoning this act of irresponsibility. May I draw your attention to something? Some years back, far over 10 years ago, OPC activities took over the Southwest. The government was watching. Then we had militants in the South South and the Southeast part of Nigeria. The government was sleeping. Banditry, terrorism, and headship crisis came up from far north. The same government that was watching them and rewarding criminality cannot suddenly rise up to take up this wala. It is an attitude of failure of the government. So my appeal is if only the campaign restructuring can be adopted and then we localize security systems, let state governments be responsible. Let traditional rulers be responsible. Even the people, let us stop watching police being overrooted and allocated to politically exposed persons. Nigerians are important. Each person is important. Let us derive a system that allocates security personnel to politicians okay. living the popular Nigerians. Okay. Do you understand? Okay. Yeah. All right. Let me go back to uh, our first guest. Uh, let's talk about, let's take a look at the, the speech of the Sultan of Sokoto. Um, he did say um, that not all Fulanese um, or herdsmen are terrorists, which you have agreed to in the first instance. Um, he also said that he's a proud Fulani, but he's not a criminal. Neither is he a bandit or a terrorist. And I quote him, I do my best to the best of my ability, he says. So a lot of people, again, in certain courses have criticized how leaders of thoughts and traditional leaders, religious leaders, have handled this issue of banditry, this issue uh, of the herders versus the farmers crisis, including the people who are involved in cattle rustling. So uh, making excuses for a person like Sheikh Gumi, making excuses for um, these bandits that they're not terrorists per se. Uh, do you think our leaders have done enough? So um, leadership is a whole spectrum of different um, categories of persons. Um, government, as an example, political office holders at both the federal and state level, then religious leaders or traditional rulers like the Sultan, as an example, then religious leaders like Sheikh Gumi. Um, now we can pick each of these category and analyze their contribution. And then more importantly, um, some have, have even gone down to the level of the family. I'm a father and I'm a leader in my house. I also have responsibility to inculcate in my kids the values of um, legality and illegality. Now where, as a father, I have failed to do that, am I shifting that burden to the community leaders? And where the community leaders fail to do that, are they shifting that burden, for instance, to the schools where they shape uh, these values, or even to the re religious leaders, or as it were, to the government? So your question is really broad, and we can pick each of these um, levels of leadership and apportion responsibility for them. But no matter how we try to avoid it, this is a pure responsibility of government. There is a social contract. We have handed over an element of our civil liberties to government for the simple reason that they promised to provide us security and protection. And I'm we can't like dance there. around I'm this. I'm sorry if it, it seems like it, I'm badgering you. I'm sorry, but I, I, I'd like to come in there. What I'm saying is it took a Sheikh Gumi to go to seek out these bandits and have some form of conversation with them. If this were to be the case over time when it has to do with um, whether it be Boko Haram, whatever it is, every form of criminality or terrorism, um, especially when it, it, it has come to a point where we're politicizing the issue and saying, oh, they are full of knee heads men. <laughs> I mean, there wouldn't have been a need for that labeling if the issue was nipped in the board. And like you have said, it starts from 
you know, the bulk passing, if somebody had taken, a, you know, taken it on themselves to say, let's, let's find out who these people are. Let's, let's have a conversation with them if, they, if need be, and then let's deal with it. It wouldn't have become a labeling thing. We wouldn't have said, oh, it's herders who are doing this. Every herder is a terrorist. And that's what I meant. I'm talking about our traditional leaders here. I'm not talking about the government. I'm talking about religious leaders who meet these people at the roots. I'm not necessarily talking about government in general. Um, you see, the difficulty with the scenario you've created and the question is that um, as, as a security specialist, I have found it very, very difficult to, um, you know, reduce this phenomenon to this very simple uh, victim, uh, you know, perpetrator uh, an analogy that we're painting. Um, and uh, the reason why I'm saying this is time will not allow me to go into the details, but I'll quickly mention that we're dealing with three separate issues. We're dealing with farmer harder violence, we're dealing with banditry, um, and then we're dealing with kidnap for ransom. Now, sometimes it is one group that is committing all of these things. Sometimes it is different groups. Now, we're also dealing with what appears to be a gun running channel that is able to supply these groups and at the same time supply supply the terrorist and then we're also dealing with a situation where the terrorist and these three groups that i've mentioned are converging into one place now the reason why i gave you this this background is imagine a traditional ruler who has to choose between either keeping quiet or being killed by this terrorist because the, the government has failed to protect him we have seen in the past um, traditional rulers who have attempted to speak out or prevent this guys from you know dominating their territory and they're killed and frankly without protection from government so um there are different levels of what i would call complicity or involvement of traditional rulers um some of them unfortunately have become complicit perhaps as a result of um, greed or the fact that they will benefit from it while others have become complicit mainly because they don't have a, a choice. If they speak out, they're killed or, and because the state, as it were, is unable to protect them. So it's not that easy. We need to remove these layers before we de and, and deconstruct it. Um, when the Sultan speaks, he's speaking from that authority and I fear for him because he's dealing with a centrifugal force that unfortunately is unable to even um, uh, you know, uh, understand his role as a traditional and religious leader. If today those bandits decide that the Sultan has spoken against them and they decide to attack him, I tell you no, no one will stop them, mainly because the security arrangement around the Sultan cannot stop a hundred bandits on motorcycles mm. with AK-47s and RPGs mm. from you know, dominating where he's staying. So that, that is the reality of the average uh, traditional ruler in Nigeria today, especially in the Northwest and not, not Central. All right, finally, um, Adeni Ikunu and of course, Mr. Uh, Ademola, I'm gonna send these questions to both of you, but I'd like for you to spend a minute each to answer it. Mm -hmm. The latest that has come from these bandits is that they're asking that Mr. President be the one to lead the negotiations and lead the dialogue. Uh, and I'm thinking the nerve of these people, they're asking for the president to come negotiate with them. Let's not forget that we still have um, these students in their custody and some staff of that school. And the negotiations haven't even started in the first instance. And there's a Sheikh Gumi somewhere saying, well, don't address them as bandits because they may never, ever want to come out of it. But you need to speak with them in a certain tone. So. Well, really, it looks like we're caught in between the devil and the deep blue sea or in between a rock and a hard place. So I'll start with you, Ademola. Uh, where do we go from here? Yeah, thank you very much. The issue is not that really we are caught in between the devil and the red sea. We are just covered up and layered up by the, the cartoons of irresponsibility we have drawn up over the years. You see, criminals are criminals anywhere. You see, for the intervention of someone like a Sheikh Gumi, I want to agree with some, some schools of thought defending him and some other persons investigating him because it is the absolute irresponsibility of the government that makes a bloody civilian or an, uh, an absolute civilian to step in into an issue of such magnitude. It is a shame on our security structures. See, now you can see that they have so much magnitude of peace and comfort to begin to dictate the terms for negotiation. You can imagine it's an insult on our nationality 
the criminals, I mean criminals, can be saying and speaking and asking that the leader of the country comes up to discuss with them. Mm. It's an absurdity. Okay. And it's just showing that as a nation, as a people, and for our security system, we are a failure. It's All a right. shame. All right. Adeni Ikunu, finally. Well, I just have to say that um, anytime the military or the security operatives come out to tell us that they need some intelligence, I think that the person to whom they should go for such information is already established. Shegumi can provide the security operatives in this country with all the information they need to succeed when it comes to knowing the location of bandits and perhaps some, some insurgents. Because if indeed Shegumi is able to go to the different forests, speak with them, and now is acting as the official spokesperson of those people, then I think that it can also help Nigeria's security operatives know where they are and maybe get some more information. Because let me tell you, Shegumi remains a non-state actor. And the more it begins to frolic with these people and be the mouthpiece, it's going to be another set of problems for us to deal with. If you look at the picture that we have now, at times we find out that some people are saying, how did he broker such truce with them, such that he's able to go into the forest with them? Shegumi is not a small boy, he's an elderly man. And he's been going from one forest to the other. So that simply means there's a whole lot of people providing him with information and the particular things he needs with which he's going to these places. So I think the security operatives are not saying arrest. They can call in to help them with a lot of information because we're talking about intelligence that can help. So Shegumi is the best man to go to to provide all this information. Well, I want to thank you all for being part of this conversation. Security expert Kabir Adamu, political analyst at Diwali Adimola, and political commentator at Deni Yukunu. Thank you, gentlemen, for being part of this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Well, we'll take a short break now, and when we return, stakeholders say kidnapping of students to bargain for certain things is a development that will adversely affect education in Nigeria. We'll be right back.